Hmm. Broadcast is live. Okay. Uh, namaste. Welcome to, and uh, let's start by you know wishing everyone uh, whoever is on the broadcast. I think there was a feedback from the YouTube channel that came in. Uh, namaste, welcome, and uh, you know, wish everyone a very happy Independence Day. I think it's it's most apt. In fact, the uh, uh, the thought that we should be doing this uh, conversation uh, came from uh, Sri Guru, and uh, you know, I immediately said okay because that was something that uh, we had to do, and it, it also uh, you know, it's not coincidence also that. Uh, August 15th, uh, you know, you 75 years gets completed and also 150 years of uh, probably one of the greatest rishis of our uh, times, Sri Aurobindo. And uh, I couldn't think of uh, two, uh, you know, two people who would uh, be better to speak about this other than uh, Sri Guru Rohit Arya and uh, Ram. Uh, Ram should be joining us uh, shortly. So, but uh, we said we would start uh, given that uh, we would start at 11 a.m. So, uh, you know, we, we did have some questions that came up through the chat. And in fact, you know, I was saying that one, one of the things we normally do is to prepare for this by, you know, exchanging a few notes. But this time we're ac absolutely going uh, uh, on, on the fly and uh, doing this extempore because uh, we've never uh, you've not had a discussion. And, uh, you know, I would like to start by uh, asking Sri Guru to, uh, you know, set the uh, framework. I, I know that there, there was one question which uh, probably you could address after you set the framework, which is about uh you know I, I think it also came up which is about the coincidence bit that and uh, Sri Aurobindo answered it in his uh, message to the nation which was one of the most inspiring messages that uh, one could ever think of you know the, the, the power of those words uh, after Bhavani Mandir the the message that uh, this one I think uh, this is one of the most powerful messages that I've ever read and in that he says that uh, it's not just it's not coincidence but it's actually a divine play and divine will that has, uh, you know, brought about this, uh, you can't call it coincidence, but absolutely, you know, this uh, uh, Sandhi, this meeting of uh, his uh, birthday as well as the, uh, the Independence Day. So I will start by asking, you know, Rohitarya to set the context as well as speak about that. Yes, uh, see, uh, as Sri Aurobindo pointed out, as he pointed out, it is not a coincidence that his birthday is uh, also uh, the day of uh, Indian independence. Uh, 75 years is a long time. You know, and uh, he would have been 150 years old. So why are we talking about somebody who would have been 150 years old uh, just because his birthday happens to be also uh, Independence Day? You know, because the vision that he had, the vision that he had for society, the vision that he had for the direction the country and its people should take, he was... Uh, genuinely prophetic. He was genuinely somebody who had a far-sighted vision about it and he had a very clear roadmap, which we haven't tried to follow in any way, unfortunately. So we'll try to look at that roadmap. We'll try to look at what his vision was for India and uh, you know how far we have succeeded. We have done some things well. We have failed in many things and there is a appalling deracination which would have probably upset him the most you know so i want to ask this question also why is it why is it that somebody who started writing in 1910 still has a better grasp of the indian psyche and how indian political movements play out than people of today I mean, you read some of his stuff and it's like he's talking about today. He's talking exactly about what is playing out in contemporary terms. So, you know, when you ignore the words of a Rishi, there is a heavy price to pay. And we are paying that price. 
Let us not be in any uh, doubt about it. So essentially, what was his political vision for India? What was his spiritual vision for India? In his case, uh, he did not think that the two were separate. He did not think that uh, you could have a political vision without a spiritual vision. So you know what we are trying to do is look at uh, look at uh, what happened. You know that is also something that I feel very strongly about that. Uh, the national project was heading in one direction and then it got derailed into a, a another direction it was it was going to be it was going to be uh, something authentic something rooted in the soil it was going to be bharatiya and then it became idea of india if you want me to put it in those terms you know, so I have said, the, uh, yeah, I have said that uh, uh, Bharat, I have said that Bharat needs uh, independence from the idea of India. You know, uh, I mean, I'm very clear about it that the idea of India is a secular, dhimmi, asuric mindset, and we've had enough of it. You know, it's been 75 years and it's just brought catastrophe and ruin to the country, nothing good. We've had enough of it. So, in terms of why does this always happen that we keep getting these great rishis to be born amongst us? They give very clear and simple prescriptions and we still manage to make a complete mess of it. You know, like why does, uh, what is so difficult about uh, comprehending what they are saying? Yes, in the case of Aurobindo, I can say comprehension may be a bit difficult for people. Maybe. <laughs> because, <laughs> Because his, uh, you know, what do you call, his uh, language is a difficulty. But the ideas are crystal clear. So, you know, like uh, in terms of what sort of a nation we should be, in terms of what, how should we move forward as a people and how should we move forward individually, uh, we kind of basically ignored everything. And now we are seeing the price that we are paying for that. So I just... I just thought that 75 years is enough time to uh, check whether a society is doing well or a society is regressing. And I don't think we are doing that well. There have been great successes in some ways. There are no famines. Standard of living has gone up. Life expectancy has gone up. And the British left life expectancy was 32 years. Absolutely. It's Not even 40. 70. Yeah. yeah. So there have been some successes, but why is there this general malaise? Why is there this general unease and uh, dissatisfaction everywhere? Except for a few political types, people are not happy with the direction the country is going. You know, People are not happy where we are as a society, as a people, as a country. So, you know, since Sri Aurobindo said that this is divine will that India is independent on his birthday, yeah. <laughs> let us examine what happened. <laughs> let us at least have a conversation because we are not even having a conversation. On, we, on that very very point, uh, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? Yeah, no, you, no, 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 okay. please. No, uh, on, on that very point, you know, you talked about, uh, you, you said two things. One, that Aurobindo is uh, not easy to comprehend too, but hmm. you said his ideas are uh, crystal clear. I was in actually a conversation with somebody who uh, is, a, is a professor at a, at a college you know, from one of the best universities in, in India and a highly dharmic individual uh, who has read the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, practicing Hindu. And he was uh, saying that uh, he's always had great difficulty in actually understanding uh, Sri Aurobindo every time he uh, read him. You know, and, and I was actually surprised because he said one of the books that he started reading recently was The uh, Secret of the Vedas. That's a book that uh, we've discussed earlier. And, Wrong book. And, and you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't start with that, obviously. <laughs> but he Wrong also book. mentioned that the uh, yeah essays uh, on the Gita also was something that he seemed to struggle with. Uh, given that, uh, uh, so how... Do you think one of the reasons, and I'm playing the devil's advocate, is that here is that is it also because uh, the people don't seem to be understanding where he came from or what he was trying to convey, and therefore this uh, confusion with uh, Sri Aurobindo, one part of it. Second That's is wrong. that you know, yeah, I, I will, yeah, and uh, and second part is that have we 
we seem to have i mean invested everything on the uh, political setup right now we believe that it's it's going to be a political savior so going to save us so so yeah I'll, i'll pass it on to ram and then maybe you could also you know ask answer that uh, question again ram welcome yeah. uh, uh, yeah. namaste ramesh um, yeah. 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 pranam namaste. to all the viewers and uh, sorry for a technical glitch i didn't know few technicalities you know while i was just till the last minute logging in but i think i came in uh, at the right time while i was listening to <laughs> shri guru telling few very nice things which are very difficult to digest <laughs> for us <laughs> so yeah so you know uh, it's very very convenient for us to keep uh, congratulating ourselves so yes there is there is a need and necessity for con- self congratulation but there is a limit to it beyond a point you know we have to uh, we all know uh, and we are very conscious of how grave has been the loss in the post independent india uh, the loss to the essence of the bharata culture has been at a greater pace post independence than before and uh, so it's a it's a kind of a paradox uh, perhaps an irony that what did independence really uh, get for us is a much swifter decline in things that are really dear to us and uh, so that has to be taken into account while we continue to congratulate ourselves for many other strides we have made um to your specific question on i think you ended primarily ramesh on trying to say that uh, have we moved towards uh, becoming more of worshippers of the political leaders or you know getting more enamored yeah. by yeah that, uh, yeah two part question actually ram where the first part was the difficulty in comprehending uh, arbindo's writings one one is obviously the uh, the uh, his uh, amazing uh, language the language that he was using second is i think people also struggle with the uh, with his thought process itself i mean he seemed to be coming from a, a level that was so high perhaps i don't know and i'm playing the devil's advocate and that yeah. uh, people see many people seem to uh, struggle with uh, understanding him and therefore they take the easy way out where they uh, read uh, i'm i'm conjecturing here the easier stuff that is available uh, this one and not really looking at because my own understanding of the uh, vedas uh, actually improve uh, you know drastically improved after i actually read the secret of the veda or arbindo's uh, works and and the kind of uh, insights that you get into the bhagavad gita after reading uh, essays on the gita is simply impossible uh, from any other book i mean that's uh, how i see it yeah. but not everybody yeah. seems to see it in that way that's what i was mm-hmm. getting at yeah so uh, i mean coming specifically to the part of reading is it difficult i think it has it is definitely difficult there is no two thoughts about it from a point of view because i usually use this phrase at a risk of telling that he has more or less sanskritized english in his approach absolutely you know that is a phenomenal uh, contribution that we will not know even for some years to come only when this is going to get more and more appreciated then we will say ha 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 this is what he has done in retrospect but this is what he has done having said that he has still not compromised on certain words where he continued to use the phrases from the sanskrit itself uh, so that is one of the important thing what it might come across immediately is that oh he is coming from a victorian era and so therefore obviously there is a classical uh, influence of the classical language uh, well you know he is dealing with the core uh, vedic wisdom which is corely you know it's there is nothing more classical than that so ram has got frozen i think ram is some obviously uh, ram uh, we are losing your son am i audible yeah yeah, yeah audible. Audible now, but, yeah, yeah. If, if you have a problem uh, leave the Hello? video and just use audio is there a is there a challenge at then we will i will try to shift to that yeah. audio part so i think this sanskritization of english is definitely a part and a challenge of comprehending sri aurobindo but the one thing of my own personal experience is if you persevere for enough amount of time then you will get used to certain core vocabulary that he has introduced mm. and 
getting familiar with that needs a bit of perseverance once that is done it will fly because the way those that vocabulary carries the ideas is way too swift and way too deep uh, so this is my advice on uh, that aspect and uh, coming specifically to essays on geeta so shri arbindo himself has said the two of the greatest influences for him has been upanishad upanishadic thought and geeta shrimad bhagavad geeta and his own experience in uh, alipur jail uh, revolves around the centrality of uh, his contemplation on shrimad bhagavad geeta so the way he interpreted geeta makes it a little challenging because so far all classical interpretations have been advaita advaita and those discussions have prevailed in terms of sense of geeta he is the one since he is in the thick of action of the freedom struggle he wanted to bring in a notion of enlightened action he paid a phenomenal attention to what is that we can take away from shrimad bhagavad gita in terms of action of course dharma swadharma these notions have prevailed uh, he brings in a very strong yogic element of highlighting shri krishna is purushottam and uh, so we being his hands and legs and the mind and all of us all of our faculties being the instrumentation of this ultimate divine will is the central contemplation of the way he brings about shrimad bhagavad gita if i were to pick the proximity within our own classical traditions which kind of resonate with this attitude this uh, idea i would say at a risk that vishishta advaita brings in something much more closer you know to shri arbindo's uh, reflection on this so uh, this these are some central thoughts regarding uh, shrimad bhagavad gita one thing that he constantly keeps at the back of his mind and he brings forth is the what is the upanishadic essence he brings the purusha tatva very strongly into not only his writings all of his yoga so that is if if one can even also say it's the yoga of the purusha shri arbindo's purna yoga so the purusha tatva he brings such a diversity of understanding uh, purushottama from purusha tatva perspective he gives many purushas he gives a mental purusha a physical purusha annamaya purusha manomaya purusha vignanamaya purusha and all of these are uh, realizing states you know these are not just hypothetical statements these are states of realization in itself so this is a great advantage that he brings in uh, in the in especially in his interpretations of yoga i think this this is a very unique differentiator yeah absolutely you know even i felt very so when you read the bhagavad gita every other commentary would appear to be like tattvam but when you read mm-hmm. arbindo it like it's like tattva darshanam itself is happening i mean you know you can you you become uh, almost a part of it uh, mm-hmm. i i will pass it on to uh, shiguru also the same question and also if if you can elaborate on how uh, you know we seem to have uh, you know you you mentioned it in your first uh, you know intro where you said that there was absolutely no and difference between the spiritual and the political vision that he had but now we seem to be almost uh, exclusively looking at everything only from the political angle and uh, the, the the spiritual uh, essence seems to have been completely lost so if you could touch on that part also in your uh, Um, with regard to difficulty of comprehension i i have discovered that people who do serious sadhana very quickly catch up in comprehension people who are not in serious sadhana they are just in intellectual knowledge building they seem to find aurobindo uh, like a matter horn you know like an impossible unclimbable peak so i would say that Sri Aurobindo was writing for sadhakas primarily, and he was writing for yogic sadhakas. He was writing for people who are very deeply into meditation. So, if you don't have a meditative practice and you don't have the touch of the shakti, which he used the word force for, mm. you might find it difficult to comprehend. You know, but the to the rest. you don't start with secret of the veda even though i started like that but i realized later it was completely wrong <laughs> and you know you certainly don't spring life divine on people you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you keep you know after 10 12 years of serious sadhana then 
<laughs> you know, or at least five, six years. I would say at least five, six years. Then you go into life divide. Because it will just confuse you otherwise. He is talking about levels of, or even his letters on yoga. Yeah. You know, like, uh, so... So to the question of incomprehensibility, I am in full accord with Ram that you need to make the effort. Absolutely. He is absolutely clear, but the fact of the matter is he's at a certain level. You have to climb up to that level. You cannot say, please dumb it down for me, because he was not interested in dumbasses, you know, like <laughs> he was like, no, you come up. You come up to this level of, and uh, the, as when he said about Sanskrit, that he made Sanskritization of English, there are certain things he's saying which cannot be said in words, but the words are used as Shakti transmission. Mm. You know, just like Sanskrit, Sanskrit verses have a literal meaning and then they have an underlying meaning which are used, the, each syllable or each word or each phrase or each sentence is used as a Shakti transmission. And Sri Aurobindo accomplished the impossible feat of doing that with English, which is a pretty bad language, you know, that way. I want to yeah. get into the whole Macaulay's victory, you know, like how, look at us, we are using Macaulay's language. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. But Sri Aurobindo... One language that, yeah. yeah, he turned oh, it around. Right. You know, he turned it around. Now, uh, before we get into the political sphere, I, I want to say something that in his own life, it is very uh, hopeful because he was completely deracinated. His father deracinated him. He brought him up without knowing any English, Indian language. He would know only uh, European languages. He would eat only European foods. Then he was sent to be educated in England, living under one lady who even got him and his brother baptized, by the way. This is another thing that people don't know. <laughs> there is a famous photo saying two new members of her. <laughs> so up to the age of 22, 23, he had no contact with India. He was ignorant of India. He just had Indian genetics. So he came back and he educated himself. And I think that is what we all need to do. You know, we need to educate ourselves. See, there is one thing called Hindu Renaissance. There has been no Hindu Renaissance. There has been a Hindu revival to some extent. The Renaissance in Europe was the rediscovery of the classical languages. Everybody used to read and write and the scientific work was all done in the classical languages. Greek and Latin were normal. The British Raj ruled India by, with people who spoke Greek and Latin. We need to have Sanskrit as the medium of conversation, like it used to be, or at least the medium of formal conversation. Then we can say there has been. We need to find the old text. We need to find the old learning. There has been no Hindu Renaissance. It is another one of those self-congratulatory things. Yeah. There has been a revival to some extent. There has been an awakening of Hindu Chetana. There has been an awakening of Swayambodh, Chatrubodh. I am not denying those things. But there has been no Hindu renaissance and you know it is embarrassing to hear it. And uh, the motion to make Sanskrit the national language of India was defeated, I think, by one vote in the Constituent Assembly debates. It is one of the catastrophes of our modern history, you know. Okay, so now we come to the sinking everything into the political. If you read his Vande Matram, you know, Vande Matram are the editorials he wrote mm. for the newspaper. This problem was already there. We are talking 1905 to 1910. This problem was every already there that people did not think that they needed to organize themselves in a social manner, they only needed to organize themselves in a political manner, then the political leaders would take care of the matter. It is very clearly there. I mean, there are there are certain, uh, if you want, I can dig it out and I can read it out to you, where he's criticizing the Congress. And he's doing this in 1911, and it sounds like he's talking to the political leadership of today. The attitudes are the same, the behaviors are the same, everything is the same. 
so somewhere we got intoxicated with this new alcohol called democracy we thought that if we uh, elect a few leaders therefore there needs to be no check on them you know there is this absolutely supine and slavish surrender to whoever is the figurehead at the moment what is the ideological consistency what is the spiritual consistency what is the uh, the philosophy if you are loyalty is not to principle and your loyalty is to a person you have already lost you have already lost your integrity you know when he led a revolt he uh, bipin chandra pal lal bal pal you know uh, lala rajpat rai bipin chandra pal uh, tilak they they did a engineered a takeover of the congress and made it into an extremist organization and one of the complaints that was made was that we have been sacrificing for 30 years and now these young people have come and everybody is listening to them and we have been sidelined sound familiar <laughs> <laughs> this is always been the case here because i have been doing something for 30 years it counts no what have you been doing that is of any use for 30 years you know so this has been an old problem and that is precisely he always used to advocate the principle what is your philosophical consistency today we have no philosophical consistency the only consistency is support the leader under any circumstance the leader must be protected from criticism because the, the leader is born perfect and this is not something new this is exactly what used to go on this is exactly what used to go on you know so there is this whole uh, abdication of personal responsibility abdication of social responsibility and outsourcing everything to politicians and decent people don't become politicians i mean okay in the freedom struggle that was different but you know today it's very difficult to say with a straight face that decent people go into politics you know? power hungry people go into politics and to hand over your entire future your entire cultural spiritual religious psychological educational everything to people who are power hungry that's a recipe for catastrophe now again nobody reads aurobindo there is a, a few a, a few sort of intellectual people keep his memory alive and they realize that this was such a great man and he had so much to say I would actually recommend that forget the spiritual works. Just take up the book that the ashram brings called Bande Mataram, which is just his editorials, which is just his editorials on the political and social situation of the time, and it is fantastic. And what is appalling to me, what is so saddening to me, is that every word is still relevant. Which means psychologically, we haven't grown since nineteen five. Just which to also add, means I mean, that, uh, uh, yeah, which, yeah. No, just that if we have not uh, changed anything, which also means uh, we are heading towards another 1947. Then that part, though, I am, I am openly yeah, saying. We are, no? we are, no, yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. We have been openly saying that, that part. Yeah. I have been openly saying. Sri Aurobindo though, actually was a not. I do. This is not to. position him as a pro democracy or anti democracy he was not such a great fan of democracy and he saw uh, i mean he obviously defined the whole of the bharatiya renaissance uh, or his vision for the actual renaissance of the bharat uh, with sanatan dharma as the central meditative aspect for all of us and uh, he there is a adequate amount of writing that he has done where he says very clearly that democracy can be if need be an intermediary step eventually we have to cross over and we have to move towards uh, you know contemplating how dharma or sanatan dharma has uh, has to play the central stage uh, in organization of us as a collective as a nation as a civilization and all of that so that's an extremely uh, important element and in general if you understand the psychology of his thought between a group and an individual he was relatively more pro individual 
and uh, so because there is a reason for it because his core focus and meditation has been the evolution of the consciousness and he was not a romantic at all to imagine a possibility of evolution as a collective phenomena he always knew there will be great individuals who will be doing the yogic sadhana and the manifestation of uh, you know transformation of consciousness is always going to be an individual phenomena first and therefore any solution or anything that would move towards somehow curtailing the pursuit of the truth with the larger scheme of things of the uh, whatever you might call it even tradition or anything else that is likely to curtail this you know this seeking he was always not in favor of that this is what this is what i, I think and you know in in this uh, concluding uh, line almost in that uh, visionary statement he says one of the things that uh, i'm just paraphrasing here but what he says is very clearly that what india should do is to rekindle the spirit of that uh, sanatana dharma there is nothing that india can do without being uh, you know connected to the uh, dharmic uh, roots and essence but we have done exactly the everything that exactly the opposite of everything that he has uh, said you know he says that there is the you cannot have a bharat that, that uh, or a, a unifying force called bharat uh, which can be uh, deracinated from its uh, dharmic roots but now when i you know when we see for example uh, we say we are a secular state but the you know i'm just giving this very recent example where the secular state feels it's perfectly fine and even are uh, fine to you do an alankara of uh, shivalinga with the tricolor you also have, you know and, and and all of that which is completely against the fundamental trying to force flags on gopurams yeah yeah only on gopurams not on mosques not on churches not, not on the yeah mosques and churches and 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 the uh, The, the purpose of uh, you know putting a flag on the, on the top of a gopuram was to show that dharma is being upheld not uh, that it, it had nothing to do with the nationalism or any of uh, those things so that that are dharma nirapaksha have... bhai we are neutral to dharma don't <laughs> what an asuric concept that is to be nirapaksha for dharma i mean it makes my head reel you know now enough criticism has come so that phrase has been abandoned but it was a common phrase for 30 40 years dharma nirapaksha if you are nirapaksha to dharma you are an asura end of story you know and so we are proudly proclaiming we have asuric values you know so today now they say panta nirapaksha mata nirapaksha yeah but please continue i just wanted to make this point because it is a very important point Ramesh is also frozen. So, uh, you are frozen, Ramesh. Camera, because I thought uh, that. Ramesh, you are frozen for a while. Yeah. I think we okay. seem to have lost the stream for a minute. I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I think in, now it's back. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Oh, yeah. yeah, you 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 were speaking about the uh, Panta Nirapaksha and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like oh, that makes my absolutely no sense. Care, yeah. The carelessness of language, the carelessness of language would have saddened uh, Sri Aurobindo so much, you know, because he was always a man for thought power. and the lack of thought power is the greatest problem with india you know that we have become intellectually feeble you know that it was something that he was always very clear about that we should recover that old strength of uh, vast thinking powerful clear thinking and uh, we don't have i mean uh, who are the people fighting for dharma why are all the engineers having to jump into it why does j s i deepak and nitin shridhar have to come in <laughs> you know they are both engineers why are they coming in 
while they're coming in and fighting dharmic causes, you know. So uh, another thing I want to say is that we need to recapture the humanities. We have conceded the humanities to our enemies. And we may be fighting and we may be winning, but they have our children. They are indoctrinating our children. Anyway, that is a separate point. Let's get back to Sri Aurobindo. You know, like so. So the 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 notion of a dharmically minded, which does not mean that it will be a minority averse. You know, like uh, I recently somebody asked me, like, uh, what will happen uh, in a Hindu Rashtra? I said, for one, there will be no calls for Sartan se Judai. <laughs> <laughs> we don't uh, we don't uh, we don't have theological uh, punishments you know yeah. so anyway those are those are all i don't consider them to be honorable arguments i don't consider them to be valid arguments but uh, anyway uh, uh, when sorry whenever hmm. somebody posts a question to me i always ask the reverse question what would happen that if if india weren't uh, a Hindu majority. I mean that that the answer to that is lies there. I mean if if we Kushan Singh majority, openly think... said Kushan Singh openly said it could be a catastrophe. He admitted that India is a secular country only because of the Hindu majority. Only because, yeah. You know, he said that multiple times in his life, and everybody knows that. And if they don't know that, please ask Salman Rushdie. You know, it would be rather interesting. Yeah. I heard that he can now talk, so please ask him, yeah. he'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's, he's going to lose his uh, ability to speak, and I think he's also lost quite some nerves on his in his hands. And no, probably... he can talk now. He can talk now. He probably lose oh. an eye, is what they said. Anyways, that that's besides the point. Let's come back to the. Yeah. So Sri Aurobindo's thought on hmm. this, so one of the most important things that uh, you know, which was very categorical from his side, is dealing with the faiths which have been adverse in their reciprocation yes. to any others with very very you know punitive approaches that they take and he very clearly tells that the idea of assimilation of these uh, these faiths or these uh, these collectives has been a failure and especially at the time of the independence itself. And he said, it is not something that you can keep postponing to address. If not now, down the line, you will have to come face to face with it. That how come? And by the way, it is not only him who is reflecting this. Swami Vivekananda if had a similar uh, thoughts about it. Gurudev Ravindranath Tagore had a similar thoughts about it in terms of inability of certain faiths to assimilate. Uh, and be part of the larger fabric and the ethos of this nation, of this civilization. And uh, they being themselves great leaders, obviously they had a certain limitations in what they can say uh, to what extent. But Sri Aurobindo has said that you cannot pass this buck for too long. You will have to come face to face with this aspect and you need to have answers for this. So playing this foolhardy of everything is nice, everything is harmonious, everything is peaceful, is not going to work for too long. And which is what I think we are right now, good 60 years down the lane from when he would have said this. Uh, he was very, very particularly painful during the earlier partition that took place of the Bengal in 20s. And as well as when again in the 1947, this has happened, he is very vocal about it. And this question, you know, the, which was a, essentially a theological and religion driven separation and uh, or rather uh, surgery of the country, you know, that forceful surgery of the country, uh, what could be said. He said this question has to be phased and addressed. And uh, the solution that he has provided, he has given examples that how various other streams of belief that have entered here how they manage to integrate within the greater assimilation of the Sanatan Dharmic thought and why this is needed even for the faith which is not able to uh, accept this. And if that is not done, uh, there is only going to be what we were discussing about further and further uh, demands, unreasonable demands for further separations, further breakings and that. So, and he had a, now we might 
now obviously we are in a position of cynicism and irony when we look at the notions of akhand bharat and all of that rightly so because everything that is surrounding us and what we look around looks extremely abysmal uh, in its indications but he had the conviction to put up that map uh, uh, of akhand bharat as his vision and he said that every single time there is a territory that we have lost has been integrated back into this civilization you have to hoist a flag in the ashram which is what was done to to an extent when article 370 was you know when abrogated uh, in this case of course the question of what happened after the abrogation is an irony and that is a different thing that we are not getting in a desirable place and uh, that unfortunately we have you know our dear friends who very clearly vocally tell you know how uh, abysmal uh, has been a failure on that front uh, but we should give this room to the sage and the seers of this stature that they their meditations are far more stronger somewhere we have to account for that whether i am not saying that let's have a misplaced optimism but we should have faith in their conviction in their meditation we should have only then we will be continuing the strength of the lineage you know otherwise we if we take away our contemplation on their central ideas then we are not serving uh, the great vision in a way so these are my thoughts his uh, i think his words in that context in, in in that specific context that you mentioned ram was that brutality must be met with determined force he was so clear he said brutality of this nature which he was referring to must be always mm. met with determined force and not through you know the kind of uh, words and uh, that we are our great uh, rajshree said something uh, recently which was so wonderful he said tamasic attacks cannot be overcome by satvik responses mm, mm. you know you need a rajasic response to that mm. you know so what i think yeah yeah so you know like see we can see things clearly because we have done deep diving into sri aurobindo the average person you know ram mentioned uh, uh, gurudev ravindran thakur so ravindran thakur had a glorious phrase it is something i have never forgotten he said that the captivating phrase or the well turned out phrase is like a nose in the ring of the bull you can <laughs> <laughs> the the ring on the nose of the bull you can insert that stick of the phrase into it and then take it wherever you want so you know we have pathetic lies like sarva dharma samabhava and that has been the ring on the nose of the bull you know nobody can even find out where that phrase originated from it has no uh, shastrik or scriptural relevance and it has become the basis of functioning so you know the 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 core problem is deracination let us be clear about it we are in this mess because we don't know our shastras we don't know our uh, uh, our texts we are ashamed of our texts mm. you know and uh, when arabindo was under suspicion the police came to raid him and once they turned back because the arresting officer saw that he had books in greek and latin and he said that a person who reads <laughs> greek and latin cannot be a terrorist <laughs> and you know i'm i i i i'm raising that incident for something important you know there's a dancer called chandralekha she used to wear black with white hair mm. yeah, yeah. she had a collection of letters of sri arobind written in his own hand now she was one of those librando types so once there was a police raid they found those letters and they found letters of her overthrowing the government so they nearly arrested her asking her, who is this arobind can you imagine that a police party comes and nearly arrest somebody a famous artist a famous performing artist and nearly arrest them because they have possession of letter of sri arobindo that is the success of the deracination project who is this arobindo i am like yeah worthy question to ask you know <laughs> 
That is precisely the question that urban India should ask. Who is this Aurobindo? In, in, in it, fact, took, uh, it took very high level intervention to prevent an arrest. Others they were going to arrest. This is seditious material. So the English officer does not arrest him because he knows classical languages and the Indian officer is going to arrest because she's got handwritten letters of Sri Aurobindo. This is our yeah. fall as a people. This is the extent to which we have come down as a people. You know, and I'm, anyways, <laughs> I'm actually not, not. I'm I'm actually not at all surprised. As both of you know, you know, I I, I constantly meet with youngsters. Uh, yeah. At bo both co college, uh, school, and uh, mm. uh, level, and almost mm. everyone. Uh, I see. You know, it, it's not just a deracination. It's a complete. Uh, I mean, they, they absolutely know nothing. All they're interested in, and uh, th there are exceptions, of course. There are some very, very few exceptions who make it. Because one of the uh, subjects that I do teach at a couple of uh, colleges is, is to do, it's, it's a voluntary thing that they can opt into, which incorporates a lot of uh, cultural aspects and all of that. You know, every year you'll find, you know, there will be 20, 25 people enrolling. And then, you know, they will, uh, by the end of the uh, first semester there would be seven dropouts seven to eight dropouts because it requires then they'll say no we have our engineering examination to do this to do that to do this uh, or this thing and you clearly see that you know they are so at sea and so at odds with what we are saying or what we're even discussing even the fundamentals that you know it's it's no longer a fear it's it's almost like we are we are staring into the abyss right now in the sense that there are very few people on our uh, youngsters, you know, except those that we seem to be uh, meeting on social media or whatever, who seem to be connected and who are doing it. But the la vast majority only seems to be not at all, not in the least bit interested in any of this. So, you uh, know, uh, Ramesh, uh, uh, if I can, if I may add, uh, this is a yeah. very, uh, you know, this is not the very core aspect of today's talk but i think but what you raised is a very pertinent one in my view uh, because you see i have a luxury of living away from the day-to-day -day mainstream society and not seeing so many youngsters and all of that which you go through <laughs> painfully so and uh, so therefore you have lesser delusions definitely uh, no doubt about it but you know, I also draw inspiration from this aspect of at the end of the day, somewhere I'm not encouraging that people have to be in their own cocoon. Uh, but at the end of the day, see Sri Aurobindo's aspect of take, getting into seclusion, right? What it points, what it boils down to is the notion of tapasya. There has to be a certain uninterrupted meditation on some of the core principles and the sankalpas we hold for ourselves in our own sadhana and also especially with the sages and seers like Sri Aurobindo who have, who are extremely, uh, you know, they cannot, it's for them in their vision of their sadhana and yoga, the collective good and the societal manifestation of the spiritual growth is inseparable from one's own yoga. So that is where the whole Srimad Bhagavad Gita comes into the picture. So somewhere we also have to have this tapasya mode, you know, where uh, we have to, I think we, I, I would really like to hear from uh, Sri Guru on this, is that we have to have a very strong, fierce, concentrated meditations and, you know, seclusions and cutoff because every single day, the evidence that mounts up for uh, impossibility of be it civilizational revival, be it a pro-spiritual, true sadhana orientation, there is too much overwhelming, you know, evidence of it. But we cannot stop meditating at the same time because of this. So somewhere we will have to have this, you know, I would say withdrawal or going in, meditate, build the strength, come back with the strength and interact with the world. That is what in our own nominal way, and if I can say we are doing in the, you know, still hanging out on social media and, you know, braving that and, you know, still doing it in a way. But I think that is the only way forward because this I keep telling because uh, for I go through a fantastic sadhana period and bang, I got into an airport and then everything just like, <laughs> where, why am I <laughs> doing anything? 
that sort of a thing so somewhere you know someone like shyorbindo and all of the uh, shyorbindo teaches us this element of navigating this between impossibilities this is a very good segue into the spiritual vision of shri aurobindo hmm. you know i recently came across it surprised me that i never seen it before but i recently came across a phrase of his where he said that if there is one genuine brahman he can create 100 kshatriyas in his area or 1000 hmm. kshatriyas in his area and i totally agree with ram that it is lack of shakti that is the core problem and shakti does not come unless you are doing sadhana and developing it you know i am now notorious for going on like a broken record shakti badao shakti badao shakti badao <laughs> become yes. undeniable become undeniable shakti badao shakti badao that's all i tell people so i am in complete agreement with him that there is a catastrophic fall in sadhana standards there is a catastrophic fall in cultural transmission i blame my parents generation and their generation completely they were uh, i don't want to use abusive language but they were cultural traitors let me put it that way they they prioritized uh, livelihood that horrible word you know livelihood you are a hood or not lively <laughs> <laughs> it's the favorite See, uh, word of all government and oh development oh god yeah. oh god settle down settle down yes of course <laughs> settle of down course. of course first settle down then do the... yeah 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 all this is for you know first study well get admitted into good college then after that get good job then get good marriage then have good kids then you need to settle your kids after that if there is any life left over then you can do sadhana <laughs> now this is no i'm serious no this is exactly the plot no i i felt it myself yeah yeah i used to go to the uh, vivekananda ashram which become the ramakrishna ashram now oh yeah why you going the, are you going to become a sanyasi all that you know in no, Rama... my, my, the neighbors used to neighbors used to <laughs> tell my mother he's he's dabbling with uh, swami ranganathanand ji was the uh, oh dear there. god what a luck here yeah. <laughs> what what and, luck uh, to be in the presence yeah. of a man like that yeah he was in the back no, to come back, to, no, 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 what what yeah. ramachandra has raised is very important right lack of sadhana lack of shakti lack of any seriousness in you know i you me him all of us have some fan following what is that fan following because we speak english very well because we are charismatic people not at all because of what we are saying and how we say it, there is a certain aspect of truth in what we are saying and people respond to that truth people are responding to the uh, uh, indrend shakti in our words you know what he says is so important i keep telling people you know it is not something new all great yogis have said ramana himself said that the greatest service you can do to the world is your self realization yeah you know and that sounds like some uh, person from jupiter or mars talking you know in today's world because you mean to say we won't get a fancy house and a european holiday that is not the purpose of my life so in terms of prioritizing sadhana sadhana must be first and sadhana for a reason sadhana to develop shakti sadhana to transform sadhana to have impact on people yeah. absolutely sadhana to have impact on society you must be very clear about all these things you know and you must find a path now i you know i very much sometimes feel main ja ke ramchandra ke ashram mein baith ke traditional tantric path hi karta hu bahut acha rahega but then i like shri arbindo also gave a path nobody is even trying so i said no this lifetime i will try to do things his way i will follow his prescriptions be open to the force be open to the divine suggestion at least one person should be there who is saying i am an integral yoga hindu i am a purna yoga hindu so that is the reason why i don't do those the the more traditional paths which will get because you know he opened up something 
he opened up something very important and i am sincerely trying almost certainly i will fail <laughs> because you know we are we are, we are talking 2000 3000 years of uh, sanyasa tyaga vairagya you know or an overlay of vedanta he didn't like vedanta he always had many things to say about mayavada at least you know but i am at least sincerely trying okay shri arbindo has a method of meditation shri arbindo has a method of sadhana is anybody trying or are we paying lip service and i decided i'm not going to be the person to pay lip service so i actually seriously started following the prescriptions that he was giving and that has been my and you know i don't have any ego about my attainments because until i attain body of light i consider myself a failure you know so i don't consider that i have any attainments at all even though that is not true but i don't consider that as serious people get one half of the leg of a siddhi and they think they are uh, mahapurusha you know <laughs> but the point i am making is we need we need to make this at least popular what is your sadhana what is the shakti development how do you know the shakti is developing what is the impact of that we need to make that you know what he said we need tapasya that word must be made popular tapasya means immediately sitting in himalaya standing on one leg and then menka wala scene you know that is the general idea of tapasya to add no. add to yeah yeah please add, uh, sorry to interrupt shri guru no, no. tell me no to add to it actually um, even even in the traditional paths if one comes across shri arbindo one gets benefited tremendously because everybody be it in the bhakti path be it in the yogic path be it in the you know tantric path what the way at the end of it it's the same colonized mind we are getting not all these paths we are nobody has escaped this education system and we are all pretty much you know if there is one thing equality that is in our derasination so that has been equally uniformly achieved fantastically you know so if somebody asks how do you define equality this is how you know please look at how uniformly we are all derasinate so all of us you know who even take up at this point in time into the traditional path and except for some rare kids you know who are enrolled into some gurukulas and all of that at the age of you know 12 13 or uh, whatever but some of us who have for whatever life circumstances have uh, pulled us into the sadhana path even if we take up the traditional paths there is immense benefit in reading shri aurobindo this many traditionalists do not like when i speak because i also get to meet uh, i know many of many from the traditional paths uh, the way he has sometimes highlighted there is definitely each path is psychologically unique there is no doubt about it. but his path is so overarching that he by virtue of calling it purna yoga by virtue of calling it integral integral definition from shri arbindo's perspective can be in many ways which he himself he has never defined this is what is integral by the way and you would keep coming across this is also integral this is how one can look at it and one of the integralities that he is talking about is essence of each path he has picked up something saying that this is something that's going to help from the tantric path for our integral yoga from the bhakti path ahaituki nature of the motiveless devotion is something extremely essential for the integral path because that's how the chaitya purusha or the psychic being can be nurtured and nourished you know having that so he has that is what the whole book of synthesis of yoga is all about he spends enormous amount of time uh drawing and understanding and assessing and analyzing various yes, paths and this is the most yoga is a fantastic yeah. book yeah this is the most pertinent book for all the sadhaks especially they more than life divine more than anything else you know this is a book and you would then come across with a complete wow feeling that you know how can one individual in the span of an you know, by the way he has written this all from the uh, years 1914 or 16 to 1924 art sal mein you have the life divine you have synthesis of yoga you have uh, essays on gita you have all the seminal works including secret of veda savitri also was 90% completed but he took savitri as a greater you know experimentation so he kept you know revisiting it so any tradition any tradition which is if if a seeker is open minded from understanding sri aurobindo can benefit immensely immensely 
I, in my own sadhana, many times I get to invoke his principles and uh, what might look alien to a traditional path, but you know, has benefited you know, because for me, karmically, there has been influence from his teachings. So, so there is no separation for me, no matter what path I tread. Uh, his influence is undeniable and inseparable for me is like a spiritual father. You know, that's how I, I sense and I take it up. See, I I would say that I find it very hopeful that people are trying to revive traditional paths mm -hmm. and be authentic. But in doing that, to fall back into that sectarian mindset and say, no, he cannot say anything to me. How do you know? You haven't read it. Correct. You know, like, if you read, you will... I have never seen anybody who has read Aurobindo who says, this contradicts my traditional path. Not anybody who's read him. Most of the people who don't read him are the ones who reject. And, mm. you know, they have all kinds of foolish reasons, like he's not of the wrong uh, caste or, you know, he had, uh, there were non-vegetarians in the ashram and then there was uh, Mother Mira who was a French. She was a French nationality, but she was an Egyptian Jew, you know, so most people don't know that. She was a French citizen. She was not a Westerner. Mm. She was an Egyptian Jew, fundamentally. Mm. I think two types of Egyptian, uh, two types of Jews. She was mm. fundamentally Asian. Mm. So, mm. you know, like, uh, but, you know, Ram, that is just the unfortunate sectarian mindset which prevails. The things that we should not pay attention to, we inflate them. Mm. You know, I mean, like, how it's like saying that Vivekananda has nothing to say. Have you read Vivekananda? Before you say that he has nothing to say, it's like saying Adi Shankara has nothing to say. Have you read Adi Shankara before saying he has nothing to say? No, no, we don't even, believe that. We yeah, are not even Vedanta. examples. Yeah, even yeah. examples like Sri Guru, like if you actually look at uh, TV Kapali Shastri uh, or even yeah. Kavikanta Ganapati Muni. Uh, yeah. Kavikanta Ganapati Muni, who was you know uh, the devotee and disciple of Sri Ramana was essentially a kaula in, in every single way and he was you know he was and he when he visited Sri Aurobindo and he saw Sri Aurobindo and the mother the impact that they had on him and uh, the ascent and the descent and these are the integral you know reflections that are part of Purna Yoga uh, they could articulate exactly his own set of experiences in that way and he was deeply touched he was deeply touched and he said there is no denial and coming to the tradition when we harp so much on the tradition by the way, Sri Aurobindo categorically writes, my journey is to the text and the scripture, and that scripture is Veda. Okay, He is not bringing in a new concoction of a new Shastra, nothing. He is saying, I am going to go back to Veda, and I am going to go back in a pathway that is being guided to me by the Adesha that I am receiving. And my complete anchoring of the Purna Yoga you know, is essentially Vedic in its nature. And that's why she, secret of Yoda, uh, you know, Veda came 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 up. So uh, this uh, we have to at the same time. I was you know I was saying this to somebody. At the same time, what we need to understand is be beyond our sectarian affiliations and the uh, enormous that we have about our own traditions, which is rightly needed because otherwise we do not know our own astitva. At the same time, there is something called as kala prava. And there is a time that is streaming along. And in the lap of the time, in the lap of the Kala, is karma. That is our destiny. And if we have to fulfill our destiny, we have to respect Kala. And one of the most important ways to respect Kala is to have complete acceptance to change. If we do not have this ability to accept change in India, Bharata as the civilization, the, the change again is a very slippery slope and everybody would say, oh, what do you mean by change? Who has the adhikara of change and all that? The change always happened dis consciously or unconsciously. There was This is the land where spiritual innovation was continuous. Civilization, there is a, a theological innovation was continuous. Technological innovation was continuous. Cultural innovation was continuous. And what we want to really feel Bharata was this pure thing that remained unchanged for now. Every 200, 300 years, there has been a vibrant change. As if 300 years down the lane, the Bharata would not identify what the Bharata was 300 years earlier. Now, that is the level of transformations we went through. And this, without having any sort of juvenile notions of attachment 
uh, towards the tradition we allowed things to happen at the same time there were great acharyas who held the wisdom of the ancient traditions so how do we adapt to some of these eternal principles in the stream of the time in the change i think this is something shri aurobindo after many many years after many centuries has said in the current context look at the macro world look at what's happening around you there are world wars there are civilizations that are changing there is nation state wo to soch bhi nahi sakte hai what do you mean by nation state you know before that and in these contexts he was envisioning what could change me so because i think he really respected uh, the inevitability of time and what it will bring up you know his upbringing was partly responsible for that because yes. he was he was cocooned away from the indian reality and he hmm. came in and he saw it with almost completely fresh eyes you know he saw it like a foreigner would see it or he saw it like an alien would see it more than a foreigner i would say he saw it like hmm. an alien would see it Hmm. so he had that freshness of perspective which most of us lose hmm. because we are embedded within you know now about change you know ram what i am saying is we do not realize the extent of trauma we are suffering in india because of the change from the rural pre electricity culture to the modern urban electricity loss of night sky loss of the stars you know people no longer function according to the panchang which they should but they don't we do not realize that our culture was very area specific region specific our temple had to be in a particular spot it could not be transported anywhere else our kula devta is our kula devta the kula is in the village today people don't even know the ancestral village so the the shattering the shattering that happened in the 20th century and the shattering that accelerated after independence we have not come to terms with that we have not examined it and we have this uh, you know what i call superficial vedantic attitude of everything is the parabrahman and mm. you know parabrahman is not like a toffee that you buy at the banyaga dukan yaar ye kya tum parabrahman ka natak karte rehte you know this this uh, this this uh, delusional belief that one has transcended all the necessary steps all the necessary attainments and therefore one has now samata of vision across all domains and all categories and you scratch them a little bit and all those parochial and limited ideas come out tumbling immediately you know so we want a larger vision we want a inclusive vision you know we talk about vishwaguru i mean it bores me you know it really bores me to hear about this vishwaguru and india the next superpower because i've been seeing it since childhood I'm 57. I've been seeing it for 50 years. It's not going to happen, people. You have the most malnourished people in the world. You still have the maximum number of malaria, diabetes, heart disease in the world. So, Vishwa Guru is that he is a Roga Guru. You know, like have some. we yeah. also claim to be yoga guru no because you said roga guru we also claim to be yoga guru no and then no today 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 we have people saying yoga has nothing to do with hinduism yeah no, nothing to do with hinduism absolutely yeah, you know the, like the, yeah. extent of deracination you know again and again it comes back to that now you know the question is okay can you speak your own language your mother tongue fluently can you speak one other indian language one other bharatiya language fluently can you read the original text in some other language i recently started reading jwalamukhi ke phool which is about uh, chanakya you know and i found that i am having difficulty because i am so unused to reading hindi so how do we have this uh, you know indic revival why indic revival why not bharatiya revival 
where is the knowledge system? Where is the training? Like I said, we need an Ashoka University for Hindus. You know, we need a liberal university for Hindus. 40 million texts are waiting to be translated. The work is immense. And instead of that, we are self-congratulating ourselves because we got a movie to flop. Okay, <laughs> I'm not saying that is not an important thing. It is a very, psychologically, it is very important. In the cultural space, that is psychologically a very important thing. But they have your children. They have your children. Your children are going to those schools injected with this poison. And you don't seem to understand that it is more important. So, you know, ek to we don't read. Ek to we don't read the text in the original. Then we don't do sadhana because sadhana is for later in life. You know, and uh, people like us, we make all kinds of sacrifices in our personal life to develop some Shakti. Then there is a lot of appreciation. There is still no support, but there is appreciation. I think one of the issues that, you know, seem to be uh, this one is that people, people think that they don't have to do, you know, that there is a, there is a uh, gradual growth that needs to happen. I mean, there are some people you, who, for example, you cannot uh, outsource example, sadhana. You cannot outsource sadhana to me, to Ramachandra, to Ramesh. You have to do it yourself. Yeah. No, just to use an example. For example, the uh, the, the Kanchi Paramacharya was an absolute traditionalist. You know, he used to do, yeah. he used to take bath three times a day. He used to do everything. That, his own brother, his younger brother, who was uh, one of the greatest rishis that people don't know about. His name was Sachu, and he was called Shivan. D did not uh, even have a, a drop of water for close to 50 years. He did nothing. He never took a bath. He took a bath only once a year or something like that. But when uh, the Paramacharya was asked, uh, why you are like this? Why is he like that? He said, even I can't be like him. Therefore, I do, I do, I, you know, practice all of that. He, is, he has reached a stage where I can, I, which I can reach only in my dreams. So, I mean, the, that that kind of, the, so so everybody who claims, you know, I, I don't have to do it because I've already reached. Don't don't say such stories because all the people who are averse to bathing will immediately think they're spiritually developed. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm not saying that matters are totally bad. No, because more people are now coming into yoga, even if it is in a superficial way. More people are interested in learning about mantra, learning about japa, learning about going to temples, learning about meditation. So there is an awakening, but it is not enough. And it is not being done in any structured and knowledgeable fashion. It is being done in a haphazard fashion. And the minute it interferes with your personal comfort, oh no, that does not work. That can't do. You know, tapasya has an element of tyaga in it. You have to give up certain things. You know, you cannot, uh, you cannot live a life of pleasure and develop shakti, which seems to upset many people. You know, and if you look at how Vivekananda became Vivekananda, Aurobindo became Aurobindo, your blood will freeze. Or even Ramana became Ramana, you know, and I mean, it didn't happen. There is a price to be paid for human embodiment and it's not a small price. You know, if you want to overcome. So, you know, to come back to what he wanted, he was very clear about what he wanted. He wanted revival of Bharatiya systems. He wanted revival. He very clearly said that, yes, I am saying integral yoga, but only after all the other attainments of all the other paths are attained. So what we have today is a situation where they say, oh, those old paths are no longer relevant. The gods are not important. We have transcended all that. No, you have only transcended into utter delusion. He was very clear that the he was very clear that the attainments of the traditional sampradaya are important attainments. They're important milestones. He was very clear about that. But you know, this habit of Picking and choosing what is comfortable won't do. You know, and also there is no uh, there is no shraddha for lack of a better word. I don't know whether you would agree with me, Ram, but I would see that the shraddha is like minimal in people today. What mm. they have is one uh, one pseudo ego investment in some 
political leader. That also we had 100 years back. We had the same situation. We had one married but celibate old man who was regarded as an avatar of God and no wrong. And then the catastrophe of 47 happened. It still took another 60 years before people started criticizing. And now we are back to square one. You know, it's like that Ludo game where you go to 99 and then that snake brings you down. <laughs> this is a this is a very uh, very very you know I will I will go to the uh, first I will I will probably reflect a bit on the shraddha but first you know yeah. I had come across this uh, Mahatma Gandhi was trying to meet Sri Aurobindo and he refused to meet. Oh, it point. is a wonderful it is yeah. a wonderful ah, so the interchange the interaction that takes place is amazing and uh, basically he is in Bangalore and is wanting to come to Pondicherry <laughs> and Sri Aurobindo writes a letter and then uh, that letter does not reach. And so his uh, disciple is wondering whether it has reason. He said, no, I wrote a letter that I write. I usually don't write more than a line or two. I wrote quite a big letter to him to tell them not to come and don't waste time in Pondicherry waiting for me. But there is a very interesting thing where uh, Mahatma Gandhi, because Sri Aurobindo also calls him Mahatma Ji. So I will just continue in the same you know, line of reflection. And uh, Mahatma yeah. Gandhi writes, <laughs> writes to Sri Aurobindo and says, uh, see, I have always had longing of meeting you and taking your guidance ever since I have come back to India. Uh, but the circumstances have never transpired. And now there seems to be a very, very positive chance. Um, therefore, I would like to meet you. See, this this comes back to that again, the same set of irritatingly persuasive skip. But this is the whole notion of not you know, having the semblance of how to approach a guru. Because obviously I am enlightened, you see. So therefore I, I take a lot of vows and, and all of that. So I have the entitlement. So he pursues. And then he says, but I do not want to interfere in case you have taken any vow of abstaining from meeting people, etc., etc." et cetera. He says, first line of response. He says, I don't take vows. And, you know, and that kind of hits a very big statement, you know, because uh, his psychological assessment of this taking wow business and you know towards silence towards celibacy mm -hmm. towards this towards that he does a phenomenal analysis of how it leads to pathologies especially if there is no deeper spiritual experience he is not outrightly throwing away all these practices he's saying that they, it has to be contextualized in a very deeper spiritual experience if lacking that you end up taking in this it is just nothing but vital indulgence and therefore, he has held to all great. By the way, he supported Quit India movement very well. You know, Sri Aurobindo was very vocal about its support. But at the same time, he said that please jack up your skepticism. Whenever the decisions come in such uh, environment of vital suppression, and people tend to give you guidance under some vow of silence, and because what is guiding them inwardly is not necessarily a higher force or intelligence or wisdom. This is a phenomenal thing, you know, this sort of an analysis of the psychological process of sadhana is a phenomenal thing. And, and he also says very nicely, but our ashram is also not very ascetic to your taste. And therefore, you know, this might not be the most appealing thing. And but then there is... He didn't a... tell him that he told Mahadev Desai. Ah, yeah. <laughs> that he told Mahadev he... Desai. Yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, letter... Exactly. Like the back and forth is brilliant because Aurobindo's language becomes more and more suave and polished. And he's just yeah. telling you, you know, it's like a persistent girlfriend, I mean, who can't understand that she's been rejected. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, specifically on this, I, I just uh, pulled it up, you know, what uh, uh, Ram was referring to and you were also referring to. He says, I believe Gandhi does not know what actually happens to the man's nature when he takes to Satyagraha or non-violence. He thinks that man, men get purified by it, but when men suffer or subject themselves to voluntary suffering, what happens is that their vital being gets strengthened. That suffering is vital, and it, uh, now when you cannot oppose the force that oppresses, you say that you will suffer. That suffering is vital, and it gives strength. When the man who has thus suffered gets power, he becomes a worse oppressor, he says. <laughs> Gandhi. Mm. Mm. Let's leave exactly that what happened. It's, a, it's, yes. a, it's an unpleasant yeah. topic, you know. It's an, <laughs> yeah. an irrelevant topic. <laughs> yeah, the only reason, <laughs> the, the, the only reason um, it's uh, relevant now is because we have yeah. seemed to have come back to anointing. Square another. one. Yeah, we have another example yeah. now. You know, we have a made in China example now. You know? <laughs>
the, the shraddha has been is the one of one of the biggest difficulties that i have come across in few people that i guide as well um there is a very strong restlessness to draw conclusions that sadhana is working way too fast so uh and unless something is happening why why there should be something happening first of all you know one is entering for sadhana process uh even in sri aurobindo's uh, purna yoga what he he takes one of the classical notions from the both uh, upanishadic thought as well as uh shrimad bhagavad gita is vidya and avidya and he says this unless the avidya prakriti which is the lower prakriti what he says that is silenced is quieted is made peaceful and the adhara has been established sufficiently there is no way that the higher nature can descend and manifest its shakti now this is and this is not something that is going to happen in one year two years three years you know it is a constant constant process so this this is unacceptable you know for many many uh, you know people and that is something that they are always trying to restlessly find something magically is happening there will be dreams there will be some sort of experiences which are all good markers that something is transpiring inside but it is not adequate for making any conclusions that you have created a solid base which is where shraddha comes into picture and i think this is what is lacking you know primarily that people would want things to happen way faster and uh, they put the onus and the assessment on the guru right away that if, it, if things are not happening <laughs> so this is yeah this is a big you are you are an incompetent guru you know you are an incompetent <laughs> guru because okay. experience chasing i call it experience chasing they always want excitement yeah. they always and i'm like you get excited about this what will happen when a genuine experience happens to you it's all superficial stuff and you're getting excited about this okay. again deracination it all okay. comes to deracination they don't see examples you see one of the only reasons i stay on social media is that i want people to see examples of people who are committed to dharma people who are committed to culture you know so that they can see okay one doesn't have to be boring one doesn't have to be in the village one doesn't have to be in a forest one can be engaged in life and still be dharmic that's one of the only reasons just to serve as an example you know so that people can see that yeah this can be done this is not something that is only for hyper specialized people yeah. and again it takes thousand people do serious sadhana you get two or three really top notch people no absolutely that's how it always happens but you don't realize that it is because they've been doing this for many lifetimes you, you know you don't lose anything by doing sadhana and not getting anywhere it will add up sometime somewhere some place but people are instant noodles maggi ke jaise they want results immediately in 3 minutes here yeah? i'm doing the pranayama and why this didn't work i'm doing the japa why this didn't work shri arbindo has done pranayama yoga for good 5 6 years after yeah. which he, he himself says that i am little frustrated that there is no movement okay. on this man and he says that no. at the best what i'm having is a sense of intuition and the pranic shakti is increasing but that is five not what i'm saying day. Five yeah, five hours a day. Five hours a day. Five hours a day. And so. uh, you know, it it uh, enhanced his uh, memory. His memory mm. became photo photographic, mm. and he could write um, poetry. He could write poetry very much. But in the end, he gave up that practice, and he went into the meditative practices. But again, who does five hours a day pranayama today? you know like and, and, okay uh, i'm sure there are some people i'm sure there are some people yeah, but yeah. for the average person you know we look at the end result and we are like okay show me the quickest fastest way to get here hmm. there is no quickest fastest way to becoming sure of him though that road has to be walked with great deal of trouble you know i think you, most the most yeah most inspiring thing shri guru of he categorically writes this to uh, dilip kumar roy one of his disciples and those letters are phenomenal uh, that the interchange between them because um, here one gets to see his patience levels just like <laughs> enormous enormous patience levels and and uh, wherein uh, he is telling that see they don't take when i am asking you to do yoga you people come back with an excuse saying that i am some superhuman and i have achieved some superlative degree of siddhi and all of that and this is not for you he says 
that I did not have capacity for poetry. I did not have capacity naturally predisposition for uh, you know yoga sadhana or siddhis or any of the capacity building on writing or, or appreciating or, art. Yeah, or, or appreciating art. And he says that all of this I have consciously done by building up my capacity through sadhana. And what we see as a fruit of Sri Aurobindo, you know, the enormous amount of literature is something that he tells in this life, I have worked hard to put behind the hours and in order to develop those capacities. So that is where he gives a sense of, uh, you know, optimism. And he says that, you know, you cannot just come to conclusions that, you know, I am just super superlative and it's not meant for And you. he didn't do all that. He didn't do all that while sitting in an ashram. He was yeah. in principal of the college. He was hmm. editing Mathe Mataram. He was plotting against the British. Yeah. <laughs> you know? He was yeah. doing all these things and the sadhana. Yeah, and also, and also keeps telling how boring it is for him to do this administrative job. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and very interestingly, you know, one of the, one of his sisters recounts that every every time Arbin Babu comes home from Baroda. He doesn't bring anything with him except trunk full of books. And that is the widening capacity he had for reading. You know, this was not some normal reading. By the way. This is like just chewing up things in enormous amounts. And the capacity that he had, that was all again yogic in nature. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even saying that people should be like that. I'm saying at least make the effort. Hmm. We are complaining that we are being assaulted on all sides. What effort have you made to resist the assault? Hmm. You know, in what way have you pushed back against this Asuric attack on your culture and your religion? Hmm. You know, and Aurobindo was very clear. Whenever somebody would come and wail before him that Hindus were attacked here, Hindus were attacked there, he would always ask, why didn't the Hindus organize and resist? That was his first response. Not that, you know, submit and uh, ahimsa, gobar dharma and, you know, all that mm. kind of nonsense. His first question was always, why don't the Hindus organize and resist? And if you read his uh, statements on the Hindu-Muslim problem, I'm not going to say them because I don't want trouble, but please read. Please read India's Rebirth, that book where he very yeah. categorically yeah. states what is the problem. He very categorically states the psychological mindset that causes these problems. You know, so again, there is a man with such blazing clarity, such astonishing insight, such miraculous foresight. And we, I don't know what, I mean, it's, you know, we just ignored him. In 70 years of our, 75 years of our independence, we just kind of, sidelined and ignored him and you know because his ideas are dangerous ideas yeah. if if we start following his ideas india will actually become a, a bharat you know india will actually become a, a sort of a hindu central country so that should not be happening okay so the government apparatus is like that what about us yeah. why did we ignore I can't fathom this. Sometimes I really feel like there is some kind of ancient curse upon the land. You know, <laughs> I, I think we, uh, yeah. I, I think we ignored because I think most people, even today, if you see, I mean, I mean, we, we see it very clearly. And most people, if if you take a cow, if you if you speak to ten people, at least seven people seem to be supporting the uh, what's happening right now. So in that sense, I think we have consistently sided with yeah, the, supporting the many people. Because they have not been exposed to any alternative. And Aurobindo, Vivekananda, Ramana, all these older, learn the traditions, learn the gurus, learn, you know, learn, read. Like said, one of the big things that Aurobindo's vision came from his reading, his enormous reading. You know, you need to learn. Okay, you don't want to read, at least you can watch decent videos. You know, there is so much of good video content, not deceptive video content. But no, you know, like supporting RRR and making it a hit is, of course, good. You know, I'm not going to say that is a bad thing. But you cannot stay at that level of feeling very pumped because he comes like Sri Ramchandra at the end. You know? That's a superficial uh, cultural awakening. That won't do. That won't do. Where is the, you know, I'm saying we need a Hindu renaissance. For Hindu renaissance, we need Sanskrit. 
too late for us maybe i'm i hope not i'm trying i'm trying to actually learn but we need people to be able to converse in sanskrit we need people to be able to communicate in sanskrit we need you know vivek debra may god grant him long life and health one by one word to word ramayana translation word to word mahabharata translation word to word purana one at a time he is doing we need more people why is only vivek debra doing it and he pointed out that three times the mahabharata has been translated in full all three times it was bengali who did it <laughs> why is only vivek debra doing it why is ami ganatra writing those uh, ramana and ravel mahabharata she is an mba is that an mba's job because nobody else is picking up the so you know we have to pick up why sadguru going around uh, trees river soil because society is abandoning it so somebody has to pick it up it's a guru's responsibility to pick up these matters but we need a genuine revival of culture aurobindo taught himself we can also learn i heard that jsi deepak is also learning kalari you know in one of his recent podcasts he is he's actually learning kalari so of course that is the other thing i keep saying learn to fight learn to fight learn to fight so where is an authentic revival i mean the kind of tragedy that is happening in kerala with our temples and the lack of cultural awareness i cannot tell you i cannot begin to tell you how catastrophic it is just from 40 years back you have these little light houses in the middle of enclosing darkness you know each temple where the puja vidhis are still mm-hmm. being done and the rest is just asur prakriti and we are comfortable with that and people seem comfortable with it. but again let me say oh, yes we have said a lot about the negative but sri aurobindo himself has said even if the situation is adverse we need to fight oh. i'll even quote it one minute please let me just dig it out here it is this is from letters on yoga even if i foresee an adverse adverse result i must work for the one that i consider should be for it keeps alive the force the principle of truth which i serve and gives it a possibility to triumph hereafter so that it becomes part of the working of the future favorable fit even if the fate of the hour is adverse men do not abandon a cause because they have seen it fail or foresee its failure and they are spiritually right in their stubborn perseverance Moreover we do not live for outward result alone far more the object of life is the growth of the soul not outward success of the hour or in even of the near so we can't give up we can't despair we can't just say oh the forces aligned against us are too great yes they are great but they are not greater than the power of shakti you know bharat mata bharat mata is actually durga Ramchandra just made yeah. a post again today which had made couple of years back i think you know so revive that you know if we are children of durga what are we worried about eh? but you know ab to we cannot we give all, up the all, yes tell me ram yeah what what we are also saying is all the names that you mentioned you know yeah. you 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 kept saying you know there is a either engineers or mbas or lawyers <laughs> or anything we we, we are not uh, you know we, we we don't seem to have a karpatra ji maharaj or any any of those kind of dharma gurus uh, who are uh, actually taking up the gauntlet who was that, uh, uh, that Pral- who was that person who was an expert on temples who just passed away this year or last year dr nagaraj or something he was very famous he uh-huh. was a phenomenally knowledgeable person we have dr bharat gopth who is an expert on uh, uh, natya shastra kama shastra uh, but you know after him who do we have anybody of equivalent stature you know so this has become a very serious question who is going to be the cultural authority it's building Shall the it? building the lineages that should yes. be the vision yes absolutely that, nothing less nothing less than that will do because uh, there has to be a aim has to be that high 
everything yes. else is only a diluted uh, thing you know yes. we, if we are not we should not be thinking about uh, you know 10 years 50 years 100 years down the line we should infuse such shakti that there is a lineage that flows out of it that's how we still keep recounting adi shankara advaita and all of that because they infused it then way back and i think i think immediately though after shorbindo's departure physically and i i do not really uh, uh, have any doubt that his guidance is very tangible for those who yes. have me me neither are on the path and uh, there is no no doubt about it um, and we do not really see any immediate power in an individual who is coming across but you know and i i mean that was the most uh, uh, beautiful thing for me to come across shri guru you know because for the first time i'm coming across somebody <laughs> and this was way now it's been more than 4 uh, years or something of association with shri guru that somebody who who is upholding shri arbindo's uh, reflections core reflections and thoughts and being at the same time having the gravitas of that assertiveness that is an extremely important differentiator uh but uh, the lineage has to come and i think shorbindo has begun that course and uh, in a way and i think these we have to only aim at building lineages be it on intellectual side be it on uh, the side of uh, uh, the spiritual sadhana and uh, our willingness to take up uh, the new challenges with continued shakti that we generate from sadhana this is what lineages do see, see the music and dance paramparas because they are living practice traditions they mm. are somewhat okay even if we have uh, titam murtam kamina titam mutram kamina you know tmk in the, in the singing <laughs> that's fine <laughs> but they they still have a methodology of transmitting knowledge the vidya is still transmitted according to the old it's in mm. the other especially in the shastras especially see one of the big mistakes we think is that our literature is only about spirituality it is not so we have shastras on thing and everything there are 40 million untranslated manuscripts this mm. after the destruction that happened so what happens to all the others for instance simple example that iron pillar in delhi which does not rust why does nobody try to figure out why that is so this fantastic lack of curiosity in something so strange it really bewilders me sometimes you know how can you just sit there if you are a metallurgist there is an iron pillar that doesn't rust and you don't want to know why i mean what is wrong seriously what is wrong i, I think uh, it's because uh, there's a there's a huge uh, loss in uh, transmission of uh, within kulas yes. also the kuladharma that's, that's, uh, tradition that's what, is that's being what is completely ramachandra is saying yeah. no, we need to create new kuladharma we need yeah, it won't go through kula and, and, it will go and, through it will go through that was the whole idea of a, yeah and that is the whole idea of a gurukula when they said that you know the father and the first guru it means that he, he used to pass it on from father to son very that's good but immediately as soon as the family dies one accident could wipe out knowledge transmission that lasted 2000 3000 years so you know we need to we need to accept as he said time kala is supreme so we need to accept the change in kala and we need to find a new way to preserve knowledge retrieve it because we have preserved knowledge we don't know how to retrieve it and then transmit that knowledge you know so but all of this happens only when there is clarity of mind and there is strength of mind and clarity and strength of mind does not come without sadhana so the core is sadhana the core is developing shakti you know we we need to emphasize on people that don't talk about indic revival and hindu dharma and culture unless you are in sadhana unless you are doing something serious you know i am very afraid of these atheist supporters of hindu dharma because in the end they always on the side of the deformers yeah yeah no yes, even yesterday we we had an example yeah i am i who they actually are yeah i i am very uh, wary of them because they are not committed to the dharma they are committed to a vague notion of culture and so they have no problem with interfering with the dharmic aspects 
they have no problem with destroying the dharmic aspects they have no problem with destroying the practices yeah, the, of the temple the, the first commit, commitment is to absolute freedom and which may yeah. and, and they see that hinduism is is a means towards that end and therefore they seem yeah. to be supporting it for a yeah but absolute freedom is licentiousness no yeah it is, it's not possible it is, it's not it is, possible it is, at all they seem yeah. to think yeah, they seem no, to think so this, well, I know I feel one of the biggest problems with this rationalistic or atheistic approach, even if they kind of put it across in in a cultural context or dharma or whatever, the word dharma is invoked again and again. The biggest problem that is we do not know how to relate ourselves with the knowledge. Uh, what I mean by this is fairly simple, you know, and this is what Sri Aurobindo brought back again in many ways. Uh, for us, if you go and you know, if we interact with any a classical dancer or even or the musician, for them the raga is a being. It is not something you, know, you are entering into relationship with a being, and therefore you are also doing the seva of that being. If you are singing that raga, there is an entire context in which you need to enter. You need to prepare yourself. The time, the nation, the you know the deshakala patra and the topography and what is the ambience that will allow for it. So when you are so when we love somebody, we completely know the whole ambience, psychological ambience in which we they love, when how they will respond, how what what are the likes and dislikes of it. So a raga is of that nature. Mantra is of that nature. And though when the seven crore mantras have emanated from the five faces of the Lord Shiva, and they are they are in the cosmic structure moving around to find the right sadhaka. They are not impersonal knowledge systems which have been just thrown out like that. They are the beings. They are the devatas. They are the complete. This is a problematic thing. This was a very integral part for us in our ritualistic mind, in our ancient, what Sri Guru was also talking about, the pre-electricity day, because the kind of topography and the ambience infuse this sense of intuitiveness to connect with the other as a being and have that relationship. And it's the that notion has been brought back yeah, brought back solidly. That notion has been brought back by Sri Aurobindo, and he, when he called the desha as the nation soul, and and he looked at the the the, the whole civilization as an individual going through a journey and several reincarnations, and therefore it for us inhabiting the civilization, we should have this connection as if we are in the mother's womb, connecting to the mother. Like that sort of a connection will build a superb strength in, in our meditations that we are actually serving a Purusha. The, the problem is that uh, even knowledgeable Hindus today uh, are describing yeah. the devtas as uh, symbolic. They are not symbolic, they are hmm. real. You know, like this whole symbolic... Uh, that is symbol, that is archetype. Yes, archetype is still a more acceptable word, but symbolic is not at all acceptable. Hmm. You know, if even a raga, if even a dance has a being associated with it, as a genius, you know, the, the what is called the genus loca, the genus loci, you know, the spirit of the place. This is well known in the classical world. Today, we are the only culture which still has some connection to the classical world. And we are destroying it with both hands. It is appalling. It is completely appalling. But, you know, to, to come back again, why is Ram able to say these things? Because his mind is clarified and purified with the sadhana. So he is able to see these things clearly. You know, you need to you need to first get yourself in order. We are doing, we are trying to create perfect individuals by creating a perfect society. That always ends in catastrophe. Any utopian social thing ends in catastrophe. Sri Aurobindo's emphasis was on individual transformation, which would then impact society. You can try to purify an individual. You can try to rectify an individual. If you try to rectify a society, it always becomes authoritarian, dictatorial, and then evil. Dystopic. It, it becomes dangerous because the only way to control masses is through violence. Oh. And once you allow violence out, it becomes something dangerous. It is dangerous to your own character. You know, because you become, you need, violent people who are usually sadists also 
so you know you have sadists in positions of power people who enjoy the use of violence against fellow human beings you know day one this whole uh, this whole attitude that all our 5000 years of history doesn't matter and you know this is one perfect day and this is a new blank slate start what is called the day one fallacy day one whichever society has tried day one we are cancelling the history of our past we are cancelling our ancestors it has always ended in concentration camps and mass murder there is not one single society which has tried day one that has not ended in concentration camps and mass murder it is one of the most asuric ideas ever possible and i am afraid to say a lot of us have that idea that august 15 1947 was some kind of new blank slate instead of saying that okay finally we can breathe a little bit though i don't agree with that we were uh, we were a oppressed slave nation you know i am very famous for saying india bharat sometimes occupied never conquered okay we can say half of punjab conquered half of bengal conquered kashmir almost conquered now reclaimed <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it was not true it was not true that we were conquered we were occupied and the resistance was always there the push back was always there it is never true that we were and you know even this british taking over from the moguls is a flat out lie they took over from the marathas you know everybody knows that from atok which is in afghanistan all the way to rameshwaram it was maratha supremacy you know so so we need also to clarify our vision of ourselves a our mental picture of ourselves as weak dominated slave ek hazar saal ki gulami any time i hear that i'm saying what the hell is wrong with you people that is not true that is simply not true it is factually incorrect to say that what Yes there was a lot of resource extraction there was a lot of famine and murder and but we were not conquered we refused to be conquered Absolutely. today we are being conquered hmm. Hmm. today we are and submitting Absolutely. you know and somebody somebody like sri arobindo the kind of uh, self respect and the strength he got from that i am uh, the inheritor of a great legacy i am the inheritor i am i am part of a great wave that has come down from thousands of years and he went right back to source he didn't even like you know he went right back to vedas which for a long time nobody in it was doing you know we would tap off at the upanishads that was as far back as we went yeah and he went right back to the vedas and uh, you know in school we were all taught the oh, four holy books of the hindus are the vedas rig yajur sama अथर्व किसके घर में वेदा है बे सो व्हाट आर दिस होली बुक्स व्हिच वी आर टॉट आर आर होली बुक्स एंड नोबडी हैज देम एट होम व्हाई एंड देयर आर नो बुक्स अभी रहते हैं दे वेन रिटर्न टू यू नो लाइक सो यू नो सो वी हैव अ नो नो आई एम से लेट मी जस्ट फिनिश दिस पॉइंट दैट वन ऑफ द One of the things I learned from Sri Aurobindo was to rectify my self-image of myself as a Hindu mm. in India, in Bharat. There was a whole defeatist. You know, today I just made a post saying all these VP sentimental patriotic songs, all singing of sorrow, suffering, defeat. Please stop them. Sing Atara Janda. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> sing Vande Mataram. You know, like uplifting, positive. Sri Aurobindo transformed that entire image because I also had bought into all that nonsense about we were a defeated people, we were a conquered people, one thousand years of slavery, and that is nonsense. We were fighting. First, we were fighting at the level of kingdoms. When the kingdoms fell, we were fighting at the level of nayakas. When the nayakas fell, we were fighting at the level of polygars, and then finally, we were fighting at individual levels like uh, Alluri Sita Ram Raju. You know? to that extent we had resistance and today i'm afraid we are again starting from the individual back up you know? <laughs> you know, like, even <laughs> even today i tell people that in a very hostile environment yeah if there is one bhairava temple that works magics 
one hanuman temple that works magic and we do not know how to go and connect with it but actually general masses know <laughs> the yeah. educated ones do not know yeah, and how these general masses survive in an otherwise hostile surrounding is because of this just imagine going and offering the if you know the ritual bhog to the bhairava in a <laughs> in an extremely would, hostile environment surrounding i Kya would love to see i would love to see a bhairava temple at every chowk you know hota hai hamare aap bhi hyderabad mein bhi hota hai bahut so yeah hanuman yeah these are the i keep telling you know i i keep telling even rajarshi that by i don't know whatever might be the outcome of anything that but by that you would have infected too many people with the bhairava sadhana that is itself is super you know super let you that is what i'm saying is examples because people respect him they follow his instructions mm. and it has a snowballing effect so mm. we need people of power we need people of shakti who serve as examples and then people begin to emulate but first mm. of all we cannot have the slave mind you know we cannot have this mind of we were a conquered people we were a defeated people we were a, you know ye wo so to me at age 57 it comes to me that bharat was sometimes occupied never conquered it should have come when i was 30 it would have led to a very different kind of life hmm. you know but hmm. at least now the younger people are all making it popular i'm seeing it being used all over the place hmm. you know and it yeah. is changing the mind it is changing the self image which is very very, very important very and powerful me, thing it, yeah it to me it was purely shri arbindo who pointed that out You pointed out who pointed out that you know no you are not a beaten people you are not a defeated people you are a people of an immense legacy hmm. which you have neglected so now you need to reclaim your legacy you need to reclaim your your cultural practices your spiritual practices and then you need to bring them he didn't say that just uh, revive them and keep them in museum stasis you know that also he never said he was always like a make it living make it evolve make it organic even uh, uh, what uh, vivekananda said that i am against reform i am for growth mm. Mm. because reform just means mixing up the material and in the end the result will be the same because nothing has changed consciousness so, you know, has not changed it has not changed so that it that one sword that viveka you know like it's just a simple sentence i am not for reform i am for growth and shri arbindo was only about growth if if we may say it that way absolutely you know that he was only about growth and transformation growth and transformation so i you know i keep trying to get this into people's head because you know for whatever reason i am also part of that deracinated generation i am also part of the generation which thought the doorway to salvation was angrezi you know like mm. and uh, and uh, you know just generally oh those are all outdated those are all irrelevant you know the 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 giveaway phrase for somebody is completely hopelessly deracinated meaningless ritual <laughs> the minute you hear meaningless ritual that person is gone Oh, yeah that person has for all practical purposes that person is an atheist and uh, yes. absolutely there is nothing that is uh, you, you know we speak about ritual I, i in fact had this speaking to a group of people who were who said exactly the same thing a group of uh, students who were interacting with saying meaningless ritual and i had to <laughs> tell them that the word the word ritual actually derives from ruta which is part of mm-hmm. our you know what uh, arbindo talks about satyam brahat uh, you know that uh, and, uh, and 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 everything that we do is is to connect to that uh, spirit within the, the the rita your ritu kala comes from rita again your rituals that, that is why you do it i mean I, or your rhythm you need to be in rhythm your cosmic rhythm everything internal external the whole thing the reason we do rituals is to bring yourself into a kind of state across your spiritual emotional intellectual physical systems such that such that you are able to connect with that shakti that is there i mean that is the whole purpose of it but people will say you know meaningless ritual and then they will say we are doing this that and and and, and, and everybody who says that you know arbindo is i mean that there was a phase even ramana they say he was not doing anything uh, but people forget that he spent 12 years inside uh, virupaksha cave 
What do you mean Ramana is not doing it? anything? No, no. There, there, there are quite a few people who say, you know, that, uh, you know, I, I've, uh, Ramana used to be, you know, naturally attained to that state. They think that the age of 17, when he had the death experience, the next was that he was sitting. Oh, quite a few. Know, I'm surprised. <laughs> There's quite a few. The kind of tapasya that, that he did, your blood turns did. to ice. Absolutely. 12 years. And he was not even eating. It was Seshadri Swami going to yeah. force feed him. Then the entire, Nonsense. The entire time. What do they no, think? I, Just because they are born, they are they are immediately Brahmagyani. Is that what they think? No, I, I think I get I get what what Ramesh is trying to tell is that ritualistically they do not associate Ramana with the ritualism. But this is also yeah, wrong. Absolutely. You know, when he presided it's even in the Ramana Ashrama, he yeah. encouraged, and even now the Abhishekas and everything go on, Rudra Patanam, everything happens over there because. All the great masters simply know what has been encoded in the ritual is a natural growth. Once somebody enters into the ritual realm, what benefits we are hit from so many directions that uh, that even the greatest of masters by sitting with these people for hundreds of years cannot transmit what a ritual can do. I'm, I'm just trying to be on a risky side of say, making this statement. No, good because, statement. Yeah, What's any the... ritual, any ritual, if you participate in, you know, completely, you see the, the number of realms it touches, the number of levels of psychology it touches, the, the number of elements it brings into a single individual mind is that it is so beautifully designed. You know, other day I was in a very beautiful, fantastic Agama Patashala and, uh, you know, there were 12 year and 13 year old uh, children who were just decorating Maharaja Rajeshwari and they were attending to every single detail of putting the flowers the way it needs to be put and everything so shastriki and when i finished my meditation and i was just going there and about to cross the threshold they said don't come so 12 and 13 year old telling that don't come closer they know the purity oh, yeah. how that should yeah. not be not be interfered with so this level of sensitivity that one is not likely to get by going through so many self help books or anything else so and that, uh, and that is why, why even someone like Sri Ramana or anybody did not ever interfere with the ritual. Even I remember Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa, uh, you know, one of the greatest, uh, and to have, you know, um, um, answers that when the bhoga used to come from Makar, he used to even partake that. He used to never say, oh, this does not work, that doesn't. He knows what, how the Shakti is infused by the virtue of ritual. Ritual is one of the most impersonalized streams of carrying the Shakti, you see. And, uh, and how to take a dip in a stream like that is what our culture teaches. So this we ritual need, that... We and, need the no, ritual the, to come center stage again. Absolutely. absolutely. For, the, for the larger public, we need the ritual to come center stage. You see the six kala puja at Chidambaram. It is fantastic. Yes. Six times a reason, day. Yeah, and you know the, the convenient way that uh, you know people say is that uh, because they don't want to do it, they, they will tell you that you know none of this is required. That, that there are there, there are there are no uh, rules, there are no procedures. Actually, so is, our, act, actually the most structured. <laughs> actually the most structured. You you take up any puja. You take up any. <laughs> <laughs> and there is so much so much structure there are so many rules there are so many procedures that need to be followed people don't even want to go through it and then they will say there's nothing there it's just that these meaningless you know, ritual people only made the uh, restless iron pillar no meaningless yeah. ritual people only made that temple in karnataka where the pillar rotates no meaningless ah, ritual people only made 80 tons on top of the tanjavur brihadishwara no the capstone <laughs> is 80 tons all these are meaningless ritual people, no? You with all your modern attitudes, kaha? Karke dikhao? Amazon pe karke? order kar ah, Amazon pe order karenge, why? <laughs> karke dikhao? You know, you have no... The, the, the ritual, especially uh, uh, community ritual like the Kala Puja in Chidambaram where they do all the Abhishekams, the sequence of the Abhishekam, then they cover up this particular lingam in, in Bhasmam and then they keep it away and then they take it out and they go through the whole thing again. And you're like, two hours back they did it. No. But that is why Chidambaram is Chidambaram. Because of that unbroken transmission of Shakti. Again and again and again. And 
you know, you may think that if you, I've seen this happen with people, that they seem to develop some kind of disregard for traditional practices if they are with Aurobindo, which is the biggest mistake you can make. Yeah. It is the complete biggest mistake you can make. People ask me, if you're such a Sri Aurobindo man, why do you keep running to the temples? Yeah. And I'm like, what Sri Aurobindo spent his entire life trying to tell you, you can get in two minutes in one of those old temples. <laughs> if you're really open to what is, what is there, you have no idea what you can get. The biggest shift for him in his own spiritual journey happened in a Kali temple in Chandor, exactly. in Gujarat. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And that is when he realized that not only is she alive, that the entire nation is also the mother. Exactly. Yeah. You know, like, he was also one of those people, oh, these are all symbolic representations, actually. The divine yeah. is formless. And then he realized divine has form very much so. And that form is spread over the entire desha. You know, it is the, the entire uh, Bharat Mata is, is the divine. And, uh, you know, like, theke, uh, you know, it is difficult, but again, we cannot despair. You know, people sometimes say that I'm very negative. No, I'm not negative. I'm only very, very clear about what is reality. I'm not going to pretend that, uh, you know, that uh, something that is essentially a turd is actually sandalwood paste. I'm not going to say that. This is an if important. Yeah, yeah sorry, Sri Guru, too. No, no, this. No, this is an important thing that, uh, see, Sri Aurobindo, after having gone through such experience, he is somebody who understands Shakti so well, he would never write off anything like a temple. That's as simple as that. And he also understands various manifestations of the Shakti. So, you know, he would, he would clearly understand the vortices that the temples form. In his own yoga, because he was opening up a new line and a new path and his inspiration was to open up your heart you know because see we have not yet touched or we and probably this is not also the sphere of discussion you know for that the core of the integral yoga the supra mentalization and the very advanced aspects that what he's speaking about that is a line of thought he opened up for that there was an insistence for a meditative approach for you to connect through your heart which he called the chaitya purusha or the psychic being to open up to the higher force and if you see traditionally this is not a traditional yoga where it's kundalini is raising or the the, the direction is upward direction it is a downward direction of receiving of the grace for that you should have a heart and mind which is or the faculties which are uh, you know plastic enough and receive the ability to receive the shakti to some extent the vaishnava paramparas have this approach you know where there is the paduka of the head so there is always the the force uh, is coming down and from this perspective, uh, always invoking this inner truth of, you know, within the avidya realms, the only spark of divinity that is accessible to us is this Chaitya Purusha, what he called the psychic being. And he said, make that your inner contemplation and connect with the higher force. And this was his approach. Neither did he tell them, don't do this method, don't go there, don't go this. He broadly gave the markers of the growth in this path. Now, based on their own prarabdha and karma, whatever facilitated them to reach these markers and make them more receptive to Sri Aurobindo's and Sri Mother, you know, Mother's Shakti, that's what really counted to him at the end of the day. That's the reason he never disposed of. And if you actually go through a certain literature, you would see still top-notch tantrics coming to Mother you know, in the later days. And the discussions and Mother being very, very highly appreciative of the stature that they have reached in terms of the access. Uh, to which that they could even touch the supramental realms, what they were, you know, trying to manifest. So he made these things more accessible in his path. We should always appreciate in the Bharata civilization, a new path has opened up that in no way can be the measure for other paths. And you cannot apply those standards to the other paths. If you want to insist that probably there is no uh, uh, temple going is dispensable, in the path of Purna Yoga, I would still say it is an ignorant uh, stance uh, because if Purna Yoga doesn't put limitations. It only puts the measure of the Shakti. And if you are getting it by the inspiration of the, you know, by going to the temple and by the touch of the divine there, then you should be more than willing to receive it from that perspective. They were, if they were against temples, why did they give land to the Ganpati temple? Yeah, Ganpati temple, absolutely. <laughs> the Ganpati temple just by the ashram, that is ashram land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the mother had a direct connection. 
also sri arobindo couldn't go to any temples because if he left pondicherry he'd get arrested <laughs> after yeah. all he came to he came to pondicherry because he was a revolutionary you know and he couldn't go anywhere because the british were always waiting to pounce on him no. so you know to say that sri arobindo didn't go to temples is ridiculous because he couldn't and then Did the nature of his sadhana oh, yeah oh, Did something disconnect? It, it went off, is it? No, no, no. Okay, you on. Yeah, I got no, disconnected. I, I yeah, yeah. Am I disconnected? No, we can hear you now. No, no, we can hear you now. We can still hear you and see you. Also. Am I disconnected? The voice no, is there. No, we can hear you. Okay. And also the, the fear video right. is there. Okay, anyways, it's been two hours, so I think we should yeah. wrap up. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's been two hours, so yeah, we should wrap up. It's been, yeah. yes, it's exactly two hours now. So maybe we should do, do another one uh, sometime again, <laughs> perhaps, to touch up few more uh, points. Oh, lost. Yeah, I think it looks like we lost. Very good. OK, so yeah, I think we've lost him. So should we mm -hmm. wind up, Ram? I think. Uh, it yeah, if he wishes to log in for, uh, we will can just hang in for a few seconds. Yeah, we, we will hang in for the. Yeah, seconds. and uh, then we can get to the closure. Right. Yeah, I was anticipating this is going to be this long for sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's come back. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. We lost you for a. Yeah. No, no, you come back now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm back again. We are. Yeah, I know. I logged back in. Yeah. I logged oh, back so. in. Yeah, we, we were just uh, waiting for you to. Yeah, you know, yeah I think then, we should uh, wrap up now. To closure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, we've. I think broadly we thought of uh, two or three things. The you know I think, of the people I know on uh, social media, the two people who know the maximum about Sri Aurobindo who actually you know, right to you Ram is one Sri Guru is the other one that's mm -hmm. the reason why we you know we've had and I think uh, I think I speak for everybody who's uh, been on the uh, live uh, there's much that we've all learned from this uh, you know this conversation so I want to I think we've lost uh, Sri Guru again so I want to thank mm -hmm. both uh, Sri Guru as well as uh, Ram now uh, for taking the time out I think this was a fantastic uh, this one maybe we need to do more such uh, this one because i think the comments are also saying that you know more more such things are required and uh, hopefully you know we must end on a just as we spoke about the optimistic note i think uh, the fact that we are able to speak about these things i think there are so many people who are coming in to watch as well as to share their thoughts i think that itself is in in a sense uh, uh, of a positive thing although there is there is much that is not happening there is much that is uh, you know troubling all of us i think it's, it also is a fact that there is also much that is also happening not just by individuals but also by long groups of individuals. so thanks uh, ram i think this has been a wonderful uh, you know conversation thanks again. for calling me and hope yeah, and, uh, and look forward to and look forward to meeting you probably in another uh, four five days yeah yeah few first. days we will be meeting and we will be meeting sri guru too yeah. i mean what a fantastic yeah. thing to have yeah Fantastic so, and meeting yeah. quite a few people. So. Yeah. So my pronouns to Sri Guru yeah. as well. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy me. Enjoy.